Okay, welcome. I'm Amy Snell, also known as the Devious Knitter, and I am a designer and also a knitting instructor. So I'm going to share with you today some things about my designs. I'm going to show you some of the patterns that I have for sale. I'll talk a little bit about some of my upcoming classes, and I'll show you maybe a few little techniques and tips. And if you have questions along the way, please feel free to pop them in the chat. I love for this to be a little bit interactive. I um, always really uh, enjoy getting to have a little bit of back and forth if you have some questions or things that you want to know a little bit more about. So, all right. Well, to start with, I want to talk about one of my uh, first patterns that I published. Actually, first I'll tell you, I, I've been a knitting instructor longer than I've been a pattern designer. Um, I've been teaching knitting for almost as long as I've been knitting, which is about 20 years. And right from the start, uh, I've always kind of developed my own patterns and just designed the things that I wanted to knit or changed them dramatically. But more and more, as I got into teaching more formally, I realized that I wanted to have certain things available so that I could teach certain skills through the patterns. And eventually I started write, writing them up. The first pattern that I actually published for actual sort of broad publication, rather than just my students use, is a pattern for felted coasters called fizzy drinks. This is um, this coaster pattern came out of a conversation I was having with a friend where I was kind of griping about all the coasters in my house being not awesome. Um, I get really frustrated when I, I used to have these stone coasters and I'd pick up the glass and they'd have a lot of condensation and it would just be sitting there and sometimes it would roll off onto my furniture and I feel like that isn't fulfilling the purpose of what I have a coaster for and I used to have some leather coasters and they would kind of stick to my glass and then they'd drop off and then the condensation would go anywhere go everywhere and I didn't like those either um, and I had you know some others that were made of um, like a silicone thing with little nubs but they're really hard to wash because if you dripped anything down there, you couldn't get between them. So I realized that I had a lot of wool around and that wool has all these wonderful properties that make it really good for coasters. Um, it's absorbent. It is really good at thermal insulation. And if you felt it, it's nice and thick. And um, so I played around with that. And I, I played around with some color work. I really enjoy doing mosaic slip stitch color work. So I played around with a pattern until I found something I liked and then I felted it up and really loved the resulting coasters. So I, that is my fizzy drinks pattern. It is a pattern that you knit up in a square like this. It's actually a square a little bit bigger than this, um, but then you felt it. And I really enjoy um, making these i kind of call them my potato chip knitting i've made them in bunches of different colors because it knits up really quickly you kind of knit it pretty loosely at a big gauge and then i get to do with it all the things you're not supposed to do with your knitting um i can't i i don't worry about weaving in my ends i kind of carry the yarn kind of up the side in no particular way because you trim it at the end um, and so you can just trim the things off. I had ends kind of any which way, especially in some of these multicolored versions, lots of ends, and I didn't do anything with them. And then I threw my knitting in the washing machine, which of course you would never, never do, except here you do because you want to, it's on purpose. And I put it in the washing machine, I threw it in the dryer, um, I beat it up pretty badly. And then when it was a little bit wrinkled and rumpled, I just stuck it under my cast iron frying pan until it was really flat. And then I cut it. I, I got out a pair of scissors and I cut it. And it, you know, and it, you know, you, you have to trust wool if you're using non superwash wool, which of course you have to for this pattern, you can mm. cut it and the edges don't fray or come apart at all. Um, I absolutely did it in my washing machine and I always get questions about can you use a front loader washer? I did and I do. Um, I tend to put it inside a little lingerie bag or inside a uh, like one of those zippered um, pillowcase covers. 
just because years and years ago I read the story about the yarn harlot ruining her washing machine pump because she did a lot of felting and apparently some fuzz got into the pump. So I do keep them in a little bag in case any, you know, in case they're producing a lot of fuzz, but I haven't had any problems actually with fuzz. So yeah, I, I, I do that there. I, I do know someone who actually felted some fizzy drinks coasters in a KitchenAid mixer with their paddle attachment and some suds. I have also done some of these when I wanted to get them a little bit, just a little bit more densely felted. I took two really big mixing bowls in my sink, one with ice water and one with water as hot as I could stand it. And I put some detergent, some dish detergent in there and I scrubbed them like I was scrubbing washcloths together and they felted up beautifully. Uh, so I love these. They seem to protect my tables really well. I haven't had any damage from, with, from them. If there's condensation, they just absorb it and it works well with hot or cold. And, you know, I do, I do felt it up nice and thick. So it is a pretty protective surface. surface. Um, and also can kind of make them in all co different colors to match my decor. I know someone who even did some to match their favorite sports teams. These are, as I said, made out of a non-superwash wool. That is incredibly important. The uh, yarn that I initially ma made these up in is Morehouse Merino's Three Strand Merino. So it's a super soft, <laughs> squishy yarn, which is really fun and it feels soft and nice to work with. And then you kind of beat it up. Um, so it's not as super soft anymore. It's a little stiffer, but it's, it's a great yarn for this because it comes in all kinds of different colorways. But there's lots of other good yarns that would work. I've seen some people do this in Noro, which is fantastic just for the color combinations that you can get. And I've also seen it done really successfully in Cascade 220, just, you know, plain, simple, or like a Knit Picks Wool of the Andes worsted, just anything that's not super wash that comes in some colors you like that's about a, a worsted yarn. Um, so I did write these up in different color options. We have the two color version. And this, of course, is the two color version reversed. I did it twice. And then I wrote up a four color version because I thought that would be fun. And since I couldn't stop, eventually I wrote up a 10 color version. And I just really wanted to play with all of my favorite colors and play with putting the color break in a different place in the pattern. So they're all the, basically the same pattern and just different treatments of how we do the color work. You can find that pattern as well as all of my patterns on my website, deviousknitter.com. And through this weekend, the patterns as well as my classes, if you buy them um, through my website, deviousknitter.com, you can take 15% off with this code SPRING15. All right, any other questions about felting or beating up your knitting? <laughs> I saw a few reactions about the, the putting the knitting in the washing machine. All right, the next pattern I want to talk to you about is my socks patterns. Um, I have a couple of sock patterns out. This, this one is called Wanderly. This is a hiking sock. And it is made with a sport weight yarn. It's a little thicker yarn than you're probably used to making socks out of. Um, I did this because I had the opportunity to work with another Morehouse Merino yarn. Um, this is their Gator yarn, which is a sport weight, but it's got a really tight twist to it. So it's got combines the qualities of being very soft, but also durable and long wearing. And I also really found out when I started swatching for these how much I enjoyed making socks that knit up so fast in a sport weight yarn. So they're still pretty knit pretty tightly. I happen to knit these on a size three, but then I knit my normal socks on a size one. So for me, these went pretty fast. They're knit from the toe up, which is my preferred construction method because you, you have a lot of options for customizing the fit as you go. And the pattern talks about that, where you can do that. It is knit in four different sizes uh, for, for four different adult sizes. It would fit like a youth large and upward. Um, and, but you've got options in there for 
as I sort of tell you how to scale that bigger or smaller if you want to. Construction wise, it's got an afterthought heel, which I think is really a fun construction. It's also really, I think, a very approachable construction, especially if you're just getting started with socks. Um, this is a really easy way to do it. And the instructions are all in there. Again, because I'm a knitting teacher, I always want you to learn something when you're working on my patterns. So I try to include little written tutorials as well as video links uh, to the videos that are up on my YouTube channel. So I have a number of different small little tutorials on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash devious knitter. And how to do afterthought heels, how to do the Judy's magic cast on, which is where we start at the toe. And we start that seamlessly at the toe where it just sort of starts out of nothing and you get no visible seam there. One of the fun things I did with these socks is their opposites. So the left sock has a cable that twists to the left and the right sock has a cable that twists to the right. It's okay if you want to wear them on the other so on the other foot, but you know, I probably won't. <laughs> Um, another fun thing that I played with in these is this, the cables don't cross on the same rows and that gives them a, a lot of movement in the patterning and I think it's something that's it's unusual. Generally cable patterns always cross on this all the cables on the same rows, but there's not really a reason why you have to and that's something that I really enjoy. I like to explore is there a reason why we always tend to do it this way? Or is it just that no one's played with doing it a different way? So I will always tend to choose to play with it a different way and see if it works. Um, you don't get to see my failures. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> so I really enjoyed these socks, had a great time with those and decided to do another similar sock, um, a follow on called Wanderoo. These are knit at the same gauge in a sport weight yarn, but they have some different construction elements. Uh, these also are toe up, but I did a very different heel construction. This is an afterthought heel and I also and I added in a little wedge shaped gusset that solves the problem that some people have if you have a high instep of needing a little bit more room across the heel and ankle. I always, I, I sometimes hear complaints about, oh, I don't like to do short row heels. They're simple, yeah, but they're not as adjustable or customizable to a higher instep or a wider heel. Well, they can be, and I teach you how to make this little gusset and how to customize that as well. Because really, if you're going to be knitting your own socks, they should fit you perfectly. I did a little bit of a different treatment up here on the cuff, um, doing a solid color cuff instead of here on Wanderly, where we have just a tip of color at the cuff. And the cables are different. They are different size cables, and these cables don't cross back. They sort of wander back and forth. But again, because I'm devious like that, the two socks actually have the cables behave in opposite ways. The other nice thing about these socks being knit at the same yarn, at same yarn weight as these, is that they're actually interchangeable to a certain extent. The patterning, while it's different, is based on, still based on a 2-1 pattern of cables, and the numbers for the socks for the different sizes are all the same. So if you wanted to do this sock, but put in the afterthought heel, you can swap that out. Or if you wanted to do this sock, but use this cable pattern from this one, you can, they swap out. And eventually there's going to be a third one in that series. And all of them will have different heel constructions, different cuff treatments, and a different cable pattern but they're all going to be swappable with each other. Um, the next thing I want to show you is a little bit of some tips from some of the sock techniques that I use with these socks. 
Uh, these are tiny little two by two twists. And one of the things that I show in the pattern is how to do them without a cable needle. So I'm going to switch my camera now. I'm going to show you how you can do that. Knitting those little twists and socks without a cable needle because these do twist so very frequently that it would get pretty tiring to be getting out the cable needle all the time and you really don't need a cable needle for a two by two twist. In actuality, you don't need a cable needle for any cable. I do teach a class on cabling without a cable needle. Um, I don't have that coming up in the schedule too soon, but if you're interested in that one, you can always subscribe to my newsletter on my website and you get information the next time that class comes around. All right, so first one, pretty easy. For the left cross, what I do is I ignore the first stitch coming up on the needle. I'm going to go knit into the second one over here first. The way I do that is I just reach behind here, go into the back leg there, pull that stitch. But before I take that off the left needle, I knit into the front leg of the first stitch that's in front of it. And I've got a little twist, a little one by one twist or a one over one left cross. I'll show you again. Reach around behind into the second stitch and I'm going to be knitting into the back leg of the second stitch. Before I pull it off the needle, I'm going to go into the front leg of the first stitch. So I've just knit them out of order. I've also pulled another stitch off my needle. So let me get that back up there. There, I've knit them out of order. And we've got a little cable cross. I'll do that again. Second stitch, then the first. And there we go. To do the right cross, I'll knit a few stitches plain in between. To do the right cross, it's a little bit different. I'm going to start by going into both of these two stitches as though to make a knit two together. So I'm going to go into them this way, into the second stitch first. And I'm going to take them off the left needle onto the right. Now I'm going to put them back on the left needle, but they're in a new order. I've now twisted them around and reversed their order. Now that they're reversed, I'm going to knit into each of them through the back leg. And there's my one over one right cross. I'll show that again. Go into the first two stitches as though to do a knit two together. Take them off the left needle, back on, off, back onto the left needle in the new order, and knit them as they present the new stitch one and two, both through the back loop. And there you go again. There's our one over one right cross. I'll show that one more time. Go into both stitches as though to knit two together. Take it off the left. Whoops! That was a knit two together. You don't want to do that. Just put the needle in as though to knit two together. Take it off the needle and put it back. Now we knit through the back leg of both stitches in the new order. So there we go, we've got our right cross and left cross, just like we use in those patterns. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my other classes that I have coming up soon. 
as I said, um, we do some short rows in the heels here of these socks, and I do a whole class on short rows. In my short row class, I teach four different short row techniques. I teach the wrap and turn, I teach the German short rows, I teach Japanese short rows, and I teach shadow wrap or twin stitch short rows. If you're not familiar with short rows, there are a lot of different places in knitting where they're super handy. One of them, of course, is in turning sock heels. But there are a lot of other places where short rows are super handy. Um, if we're doing a sweater and we want to do a little bit of extra shaping to allow for a larger bust, we can sh use short rows to shape there. We can also use it for inventive things like raising the back of a collar uh, it's a method where we can sh um, form a sleeve cap in a sweater if we're knitting from the top down. We can also use it to shape hats. This is a sort of an unusual hat construction. It's not my hat. This is a little hat called Aviatrix, but it doesn't go around and around and around. It actually makes little panels that are shaped with short rows. And they make the fabric sort of bulge out and we use that to our advantage here. So another way that we like to use short rows is you, you'd see them a lot of times as a decorative element, especially if you're using yarn with long color changes in a wrap or shawl or something, you can go back and forth and back and forth in these short rows and make decorative elements and you can stack them in different ways. And one of the things that I talk about in class is evaluating our project to decide what method of short rows is going to be the best for that project. A garter stitch project like this, I would make a different choice than I would for something in stockinette like this. And in this hat, I would make a different choice of short row type than I would use for a sock. And in the pattern, the class, we talk about what are some of the reasons why we make those choices and what is it about the way each different method is constructed that lends it to being better or worse for certain projects. That short rows class is coming up June 30th. Uh, it is 530 to 730 PM Pacific time, 830 to 1030 Eastern, and it's called Adventures in Short Rows. You can find that on my website, deviousknitter.com. And you can use the 15% off code SPRING15 if you sign up by tomorrow. And that's good on any of my self-hosted classes that you can find on my website. So whether or not I talk about them today, that's applicable for all of those. I have a couple of other uh, classes coming up. I have two coming up just next weekend, May 8th, if you're around. Uh, I think I have room left in both of my classes. The first class I'm teaching uh, next Saturday the 8th at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, is brioche increases and decreases. So if you are already doing a little bit of very basic brioche, we're going to take our very basic brioche and I'm going to explore doing increases and decreases. We're going to be doing, you know, introducing a little bit of patterning. And we're going to be working in two colors in the round, which don't tell anybody. It's the easier way to do brioche. It's the way I like to teach it. Um, I think it's a lot easier to keep track of what you're supposed to be doing with which yarn and to know what round you're on, what stitch you're on, because the two, pat the two colors actually help us keep track. So we'll be working on that. And I'll also be sharing things like how to control which color stitch lays on top of which when you're doing your decreases and also some different ways to form increases that look diff like different things. So if you want to be playing around with your brioche and maybe doing some of the, you know, changing things up or making your own patterning, you'll know how to do that. Or if you just need a little hand holding with your brioche, you want you ready to take on one of those beautiful, you know, Nancy Marchant patterns with all the leaves and the beautiful, beautiful different um, patterning, you do need to, need to know how to be doing your increases and decreases comfortably. So we'll be practicing those. The other class that I'm teaching next week is called Ladderback Jacquard. 
it is a technique for stranded knitting. If you have concerns about your tension in stranded knitting or the length of floats in stranded knitting, this is the solution for it. Um, what ladder back jacquard does is it allows you to take color work across very large distances in your knitting without needing to catch floats. And for example, um, in this part of the swatch, you can see, you might be able to see, um, you can see some dark yarn peeking through here. And that's what happens in most color work techniques. If you're, if you're catching your floats, you're going to have this tendency to peek through. And it also has a tendency to pull in or tighten your work locking floats that way affects your stretch your fabric is not as stretchy ladder back jacquard fixes that ladder back jacquard you wind up with color work that is beautifully stretchy all the way through does not affect the stretch at all um, and it also allows you to span much much larger spaces in your color work knitting so you could go across 20 stitches if you want um, you can actually use this technique to create little spots of color that might look like intarsia but aren't if you're if you're just a little bit experienced with stranded knitting and you know the basics you can knit with two colors already you know enough to take this class with me um, a lot of people find that working ladder back jacquard really helps their tension um, i know someone who was working on a sweater where she had nine stitches between her floats in, in a section of Fair Isle and she just couldn't get the tension right. And this is a sweet fix for that. So hope maybe some of you can join me in that class. That's next Saturday, May 8th. It's noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern, and that's a two hour class. The next class after that that I'm going to be teaching is called Latvian Braid and Other Clever Twists. We are going to again be looking into color work and we're going to play with some of these Eastern braids, Latvian braid and Vickle braid or Estonian braid. Um, they're a lot of fun. You can just kind of spice up your color work knitting with them. They're great on mitten edgings or the edges of scarves or just kind of thrown into a color work project. And we'll also look at some fun things like corrugated ribbing and a few other color work techniques. These are pretty simple things. Um, they're unusual, but they're not super hard. They're some of those things where, um, you know, once you've done it, it's so oh, neat. I just want to do this everywhere. So that class is May 12th, and that's an evening class. It's uh, 5.30 Pacific time or 8.30 Eastern, and that's a two-hour class as well. The following week, uh, Tuesday, May 18th, I'm going to be doing a class on splicing. It's called Up Your Ends Game. And in this class, I explore, I think, almost all of the 19 different ways that I know to join yarn in your knitting. And we will talk about what is good about some of them for certain projects and what's, you know, why you wouldn't want to use some in other projects. We'll talk about the Russian join. We'll talk about weaving in ends. We will talk about spit splicing. We will talk about clasped weft. We will talk about braiding. We will talk about some other things that you probably haven't heard of before. We will talk about locking floats to weave in ends we, because that's a way you can join yarn. Um, it's a really fun class if you want to perfect some of the details of your knitting. Or if maybe you're a newer knitter and you only know one way to join yarn and it's maybe not working for you all the time. We explore lots of different ways to do this. And we also talk about what kinds of projects these are best in. You know, you don't do the same kind of join in a lace project with fingering weight silk yarn that you do in a fair isle project and you don't use the same kind of joins in a fair isle project as you do on a chunky weight scarf 
So we'll talk about lots of those things on May 18th. Now that one in particular is not self-hosted. So um, that one, I cannot offer you the discount, unfortunately, but um, that one is hosted through Not Just Yarn in Colorado. And there is a link on my website to her site where you, where you can sign up for that class. Um, are there paper handouts for these classes so we can review afterwards or some other way to remember what we see? Yes, I do give handouts. Um, I have, depending on the class, they're, you know, what's in them, of course, uh, changes based on what the class material is. Um, and I generally, as long as the students are willing, I record my classes and I leave them up just for student access for about two weeks after class. So. Um, a lot of folks really like that they'll, they'll go back a couple days later and rewatch and rework some of the things that they're working on and, or that are that they've learned. Um, it's also, I, I think it's just a nice insurance in case somebody has technical problems or loses electricity or their cable goes out or something. Um, I actually had that happen. Somebody had a thunderstorm go through in the middle of, you know, the first 10 minutes of class. Um, and she couldn't get on back on that night, but she was able to get on and get watch the recording. So that was useful for her. Another class that I have coming up is called Cooler Cast-Ons, Better Bind-Offs. Um, and that class is June 9th. It's another evening class from 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 Eastern. That class, we talk about cast-ons and bind-offs. We talk about maybe some old favorites and why you might want them for particular uses in particular places. And I introduce lots of very exciting and different things, provisional cast-ons and crochet and which ones match, you know, bind-offs and cast-ons that match each other. We're talking about sewn bind-offs. We're going to talk about stretchy bind-offs. We are going to talk about uh, two color cast-ons and bind-offs, lots of different fun things. And, um, I think that's another one where if you, you know, if you're a newer knitter and maybe you only know one or two, this is going to just open up your world. And if you're an experienced knitter, this gives you the opportunity to just make your knitting a little bit more perfect, a little bit more exactly the way you want it to be. And we're going to talk about some of the problems that we sometimes have have at the ends of bind offs where we have, you know, funky big stitches and how to get rid of them, how to eliminate things that are too tight at the beginning of your bind off a lot of common problems. We cover all of that in cooler cast ons and better bind offs. And the other um, appearances that I have coming up that are not uh, through my own website classes. Sorry, need a little drink. Just iced tea. I'm getting dry. Um, I am going to be in two weeks. I'm going to be doing a couple of lectures at Vogue Knitting Live. So you can sign up for those things through Vogue Knitting Live through their website. I'm going to be doing a one hour um, marketplace extra lecture on swatching. Why do I have why does it tell me why does it say I have to swatch and do I really have to? Um, the answer is yes, mostly. <laughs> but we'll talk about why and when and when maybe not. And if you do, how you should, because you've probably heard the, the common adage that swatches lie. Um, they don't, but we often lie to ourselves when we make them. And so I'm going to be talking about how to make a better swatch that's going to do a better job of telling you the information that you need to know when you're planning your project. So you can catch that on May 14th. I think that's a Friday and that's at Vogue Knitting Live. And then on Saturday, May 15th, I'm going to do a lecture called How to Identify a Pattern That's Good for You. And I'm going to talk about all the different details in a pattern that are might that are indicators that a pattern might be a good fit for you as a knitter or might not and the choices that we make about you know what patterns we're using and the hints that patterns give us that might be actually red flags or it might be really great you know indicators that this is a well-written written pattern that's going to turn into a great project 
We're also going to talk about how to know what size to knit when you're doing a garment. We're going to talk about yarn substitution. Um, all these choices that you're making when you're kind of choosing the pattern and just before you dive in knitting that can really make or break the whole experience and the, the whole end result. So that lecture is going to be uh, May 15th at Vogue Knitting Live. So I just have a couple of other projects to show you, a couple of other of my patterns. The next one I want to show you is called Glenboro. This is a cowl. It's pretty easy, um, but I had a lot of fun playing around with making knitting look like plaid. Now, of course, true plaid would be woven, which this isn't. It's knit knit pretty straightforwardly in but it's knit in a few different colors um, and this makes use of some fun variations in texture and also um, in using elongated stitches the pattern does show tell you how to make the elongated stitches and i also have some video tutorials that the pattern links to the other thing i really like about this pattern i know it's a little hard to see because it's such dark yarn but this has an eye cord cast on and bind off and one of the things that i had to kind of come up with for this pattern was a way to do an eye cord cast on that integrated this elongated stitch and set up the pattern and that all happens in the cast on so i have a pretty involved explanation of how to do that and also little videos on youtube for how to do that um, it's one of the fiddlier cast ons uh, it's not hard it's just a little slower but it creates this most beautiful edge that doesn't roll and the cast on and bind offs match really perfectly there are some details i give you in the pattern to make that happen that's a that's not true of most I cord cast ons and bind offs. I do know a few folks that have um, taken this and done some of the outlander colors. In in working up this cowl, it, this is just will use just about any worsted weight yarn. It can even be superwash. <laughs> um, and some folks who you know took some some inspiration from outlander i also know someone who um found out her husband's clan colors and she knit one up in his actual clan colors someone wants to know how to wear a cow like this so me yeah, i always put my hair on the outside but i like to wear it kind of like that and I do have instructions for creating this longer or shorter or wider. Um, I, I know someone who made it for their son, a little um, seven year old, and I did include instructions for shrinking it and where you can do that. And also, if you wanted to turn it into an infinity cowl, how you can do that. So it's a pretty flexible pattern. So that's the Glenboro cowl. And again, that's on my website tvsnitter.com and you can use that code spring15. Next pattern I want to talk to you about is maybe a little out of season. Um, last year at Christmas time I was doing some sock knitting classes and I realized that the easiest way to learn to make socks was to make a miniature. And if you made it into a little stocking and it didn't have to fit anyone and it also didn't need a pair. So you could just make one if you were suffering from second sock syndrome. So I knit again because I wanted to teach these skills. I wrote these up as a pattern. This is the hope and cheer pattern. And it is honestly a wonderful first sock pattern. It would also scale to fit a human foot. These are actually proportional, um, but it makes little adorable little Christmas stockings. They make little decorations and it te I teach you how to do the, the toe up cast on. We do short row socks. I teach this, uh, this pattern uses shadow wrap short rows. So it's got instructions in it for that. I show you how to do the contrast color heel 
and some tricks for when you're changing to your ribbing color so you don't get some unattractive lips that sometimes happen when you change from one color into ribbing into in another color let me do a little integrated eye cord and i show you how to do that and i also wrote it up with some different color construction options we've got multiple row stripes and i've also got a helical stripe option and it also works in diff many different um, gauges of yarn and i include instructions for going from these little guys all the way up to a full size stocking just um, you know how to scale that up and how to use whatever different um, size of yarn you want we i did make a giant one but uh, it's put away with the christmas things right now a couple of folks made a bunch of these and hung them across their chimneys they had sort of rows of them and i also know someone who made them made a bunch and used them as gift card holders they're the perf in the in the recommended or uh the basic size that it's, the pattern comes with they're a great size for holding a gift card or maybe like a little bag of candy or nuts or something like that so i know this is a long time in advance to be thinking about your holiday knitting but you know if you have 16 people to knit these for well maybe you do want to get started in advance <laughs> one of the as i mentioned one of the color work techniques i used on these is helical knitting which is a way of doing single row striping without any jogs where the colors change. It just seems to magically go around and around in single row stripes. And if you've ever done striping of any type, you know it's typical that you would see jogs where the colors change. Um, I'm doing a whole class on helical knitting in July. That's going to be July 10th. That one you can register for on my website at deviousknitter.com. It's July 10th, 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific time or 6 to 8 Eastern. And we're going to work both two color and three color. And if we have time, even four color helical stripes, and you'll learn how to do those. Yarn management and everything else. So that's a fun little technique to have in your knitting tool bag as well. The last pattern that I have out there is, well, it's pattern, you can get it, um, but you can get it for free. It's not a paid pattern. It's this cowl. It's called the Brilicious Cowl. It's the one that I use to teach two color brioche. It's the one I use in my intro brioche classes, which I don't have another one of those on the schedule right now, but I've been teaching them about every two months or so because people really seem to be interested in brioche. So if you're interested, um, go to my website, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll find out the next time I have that on the schedule, or drop me a line. I'm Devious Knitter on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and my email is deviousknitter at gmail.com. So let me know if you're dying to take brioche and I'll see if I can get that set on the uh, schedule again soon. But in the meantime, I do have this pattern. This is the pattern that I teach in my two color intro to brioche class. And it's just a very basic cowl. It's a nice learning project for brioche. And um, since I have it, had it written up for my students, I did make it available. This is the exception. This is the one pattern where I don't really give a lot of instruction or technique tips in the pattern itself because it's a free pattern and a lot of people seem to do a lot better if they actually have someone with them teaching them. Brioche is one of those, those things that I think is really a lot easier to learn when you're working with a person. That um, I taught myself brioche years ago and it was really, really hard. And I thought I was doing things terribly, terribly wrong and I finally found a news group online and I asked that was all about brioche and I asked the expert brioche knitters and I said I'm keep, I'm showing them pictures and I said I keep you know doing this whole setup and I was doing it flat which is harder admittedly 
working back and forth and I'm spent, you know, I spent half an hour, I set up the first four setup rows and then I go with it and it, and I'm having these terrible problems and it looks all wrong. What am I doing wrong? And somebody said, oh, no, brioche always looks like crap until you get an inch away from the needles. I had spent the better part of two weeks setting these up, working the four, first four setup rows, doing another row or two, deciding it looked terrible and ripping it out again. Um, so, <laughs> but if you already know a little bit about brioche, go ahead and download this cowl. It's a fun little two color pattern and uh, maybe you'll enjoy that. So I think those are all of my upcoming classes and all of my patterns that I had to show you today. And I'll tell you again, remind you about that code that's good till tomorrow. And since we've got a little bit more time, um, I think I'll just show you a few more things. Oh, okay, sorry, there's a question. Somebody wants to know about the piece hanging behind me. Um, this is a piece, this is a wrap called Amberine. It's coming out next month. It's not out yet, um, but it will, it, it's, it's with the test knitters right now and that'll be coming out next month. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go get that if you want to. Uh, you want to see that closer up. This is knit modularly. It's a series of triangles made of ridges and uh, eyelets. And that'll be out in June. And I, and I have to admit, I think it's the favorite thing I've ever knit in my design or any other. Um, when it when it was done and came off the blocking board and I put it on, I, I really I'm really in love with this piece. It's just light as a feather and it's in a 50-50 merino silk blend and the uh, the geometry of it just makes it incredibly pleasing to to style and wear. Let's see, Barbara had a question. She asked if the elongated stitch cowl could be made narrower. Absolutely, yes. Um, and I do have instructions. That's the Glenboro cowl. That's this one here. Um, yeah, and I have instructions in the pattern for how to make it narrower if you want something smaller. Absolutely, pretty easy to customize. I tend to, I'm, I'm a mess with it kind of knitter when I work on other people's patterns. So I do tend to let you know how you can change and customize your, your pieces when you're working my patterns. My Helix knitting class is July 10th called Helical Stripes and uh, July 10th, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And that you can sign up for on my website, deviousknitter.com. All right, so I think, unless we have any other questions, I'm gonna just show you one or two things. Some little tips. So I showed you the fizzy drinks coasters, which are those guys. And I just want to show you a little bit about what mosaic knitting looks like. I'm going to unknit those few cable stitches I did. So I have a little bit of room on my swatch again. So this pattern is a lot of fun. It, it is a color work pattern, but I really enjoy mosaic as a color work uh, technique because it's super, super simple. This is some of the easiest color work you'll ever do. It's only ever using one color per row. And that's another thing I absolutely love about fizzy drinks. It's a super accessible pattern. 
Um, I would absolutely recommend this as someone's first color work project if you've never done any kind of color work at all. I believe that mosaic is your biggest bang for the buck in color work technique. So here's a little bit of a primer on how mosaic works if you've never done it. We always have one of our colors uh, already knit and on the needle. You see we'd have a base row there of that color. And when we start to introduce the second color, ah, so many tangles. Okay, so when we introduce the second color, we're going to knit a few stitches in the new color. And then we're just slipping a few stitches in the old color. And what that gives us is the old color is going to come up and show up in that row. And yeah, I do teach mosaic knitting. Um, I don't have any of those classes on the schedule yet. Um, I taught those earlier in the spring and late winter, but if mosaic is something you're interested in, let me know. Um, that, especially with my self-hosted classes, I really try to respond to, to the demand of my students. And so if I've got folks asking for a particular class, um, I, you know, I tend to respond to that and get, that's the class that I'll schedule. So let me show you this again. Here we go. We've got what looks like a single row of knitting, but it's actually a combination of these two colors. The color from below, the green, was just slipped, and I was knitting with the blue. And this is really all there is to mosaic knitting. I'll come back and do the next row. Again, slipping the greens and this time purling the blues. There are some rules about how far and how long you'll do these slips and, and that give different sorts of outcomes, particularly in fizzy drinks, um, I was actually doing certain things with my numbers of stitches to give these rounded si size, um, these just rounded shapes here, I tend, I call them a lozenge shape. They're not square and that's on purpose and that we've got a little bit of a honeycomb effect around it. And that's to do with how many stitches I'm slipping and over how many rows. But here, just on these couple of rows that I've knit, you can see that we're going to have some blues and some greens showing up. And if you're looking carefully, You'll notice that the number of rows does that uh, it's not the same number of stitches all the way across the row. I'll show you this as soon as I finish knitting it. And that's true of mosaic knitting. You don't wind up with the same number of stitches in all of the columns because in some of these rows we had slipped stitches in the greens. So these rows actually have fewer stitches in them than these do. And there are a lot of places where we do that purposefully. We, we, we use that to our advantage. Lots of different places you can take mosaic knitting, lots of different things you can do with it, but this is the one of the most basic, sort of an entry level use of this knitting technique. All right. So we've got just a few minutes left, and I want to let you know if you're playing along and doing yarn bingo, 
that I have a secret word for you. And the secret word is knitting. So make sure you write that into your yarn bingo card. And I wish you guys all good luck on that. Someone wanted to know what the back of back looked like. And I think you mean the mosaic piece. And here we go. We have floats across the back. So even though we were working just one color at a time, we do have floats. And that's one of the things that I teach when I do teach the mosaic technique. There are ways that we manage our floats. We want to make sure, just like in Fair Isle or other stranded knitting, we don't want that to pucker. We want that to lay, lie flat. Usually, there are exceptions. There's no always in knitting. I have two rules about knitting. The first one is that whatever you want to do in knitting, there's more than one way to accomplish it. And the second rule is each of those ways will have proponents telling you they are the only way to do it. I have not yet found anything in knitting that always has to be done one way. I try to be honest with you when I teach. If I have a preference about doing a technique a certain way, I'll tell you it's my preference. And that's true in my patterns too. You know, I might prefer a certain cast on in a certain situation, but that's my preference. Um, in fact, I had, I remember I had a funny comment with one of my cows. It was the Brilicious cow, um, which has the instruction. It it's actually starts from a long tail cast on, and it, the instruction says cast on with a long tail loosely. And someone said, oh, if I used a long tail, that would be much too tight. I had to use a different cast on. Well, the problem isn't the cast on. The problem is the knitter might not have known how to cast on the long tail loosely. Um, and there is a trick to that too. I wonder if I have time to show you. If you're casting on the long tail, we'll just do this really quickly. If you're casting on with a long tail cast on, and you probably learned to snug those stitches up really nice and tight together like this. That's going to have no give. What I do is I put my finger down on the needle between stitches. And when you do that, the long tail cast on is beautifully stretchy. But as a designer, you know, we do we do make generally have reasons for the things that we that we choose. And um, long if I had a super stretchy cast on brioche is super, super stretchy. If I had a super, super, super stretchy cast on this, this, this cowl would be never endingly wide. Um, we do need to kind of control the stretch a little bit with a cast on that will stretch so far and no further. Um, so it's always good to ask questions, always good to consider what someone might have been thinking about when they are making those choices. And thanks for being here with me for this hour today. Again, I'm Devious Knitter. You can find me at DeviousKnitter.com or on Instagram as Devious Knitter. And I hope to see you around again. And I'm very excited to find out who's going to win this pattern that I'm giving away today. Eureka!